Okay, so uh, where we left off yesterday, we had uh, done a quick tutorial of SQL. Today's primary goal is ER modeling. However, I need to cover a little bit more of SQL because today's lab in the afternoon is again SQL. So there were a few more things in SQL. There's a lot in SQL. I mean, the current SQL uh, standard back by around 92, 1992 had already gone up to several thousand pages, 2,000 pages. And it has been increasing steadily ever since. They broke it into parts because it looked very embarrassing. Uh, so it goes into I don't know how many thousand pages today. And there is a huge variety of features in the SQL language. Now, not all databases support all features. So the parts that we have been covering are standard SQL features which everyone implements. Now the set of things which everyone implements has been steadily increasing over the years. So there are many things which we are not going to cover because of limited time, which database uh, systems today do implement. And chapter five has coverage of many of those things, uh, but we won't have time to go into it in this workshop or even in the main workshop we will have a little bit of time, we will skim the surface on chapter five, just to give you an idea of what are the new features which SQL implementations support these days. But today we are going back to uh, simpler features. Um, in particular, we are going to look at the outer join operation. So what is a join expression in SQL? We already saw the natural join operation. The outer join operation seeks to match rows just like the join, but there is a difference from the normal join operation. What is the difference? The difference is that if one of the tables has a row which does not match any row in the other table, in the normal join it's discarded. There are many situations where you don't want to do this. So let me give you an example. Uh, we saw yesterday a query to find out the number of instructors in each department. Now supposing I want to get a list of departments with the count of instructors. We could write the query as we did yesterday using a subquery. Supposing I want to get a list of departments with their associated faculty, and if a department does not have any associated instructor, I still want the department name to appear in there. So what would I use? I would use an outer join operation. And we'll see the syntax shortly. So in early versions of SQL, this was not supported. You could actually get the same effect using a more complex SQL query. You could take a join, and then in a separate query, you can find tuples in the first relation which do not match anything in the other relation. So then what do you do with those tuples? You union them with the first set. Okay, so join up, so let, let's look at the syntax for outer join and then we'll see the, uh, what exactly it does. So the, the basic uh, join expression in SQL in the from clause is the Cartesian product, which of course is usually a bad idea and it requires you to add a join condition. And the problem with this is that it's easy to make mistakes and forget the join, but it's okay, people have got used to it. But if you want to write it from scratch, you can write it differently. So let's take a slightly different example, which is course and prerequisite. So supposing I want to show all courses along with their prerequisites. Now not all courses have prerequisites. So I still want the course to appear with no prerequisite shown against it. So that it's clear to people that there is no prerequisite for this course. So here are, uh, here's a small relation, course with only three rows and a prereq with three rows. Uh, you will notice that bio301 has a prereq, CS190 has a prereq, but CS315 does not have a prereq. On the other hand, there is a CS347 here which is not in the course relation, which actually violates the foreign key dependency. But just for the purpose of illustration, let's pretend there is no foreign key dependency and this is the database that we have. So now let's look at how outer joins work. So this first query is course left outer join prereq. What does a left outer join mean? It means the relation on the left side, in this case course, even if it doesn't, if a particular row in course does not match any row in prereq, in the normal join it would be thrown away. In the left outer join, the rows are preserved and they're retained. But of course you don't have a matching value for columns from the other relation. So what do you do with those columns? You put a null value. So in this case, this is a natural left outer join. So let's just uh, see the schema in the previous slide. 
What is the common attribute here? Core side. So natural join equates core side. Note also that core side is not null here. If you uh, see that core side from the left relation is C1315, prereq ID is null. There is no matching tuple. So if you actually looked up the core side from the prereq relation for this third tuple, it would be also null because there is no tuple there. But because this is natural join, it takes a non-null value. The column appears only once. Remember, natural join, column appears only once. So the non-null value is taken. For if you split this course ID into course.course ID and prereq.course ID, prereq.course ID would be null, course.course ID would be not null. But since they are merged, we keep the non-null value. Okay. That should be straightforward. Now there is a symmetric natural right outer join, which preserves rows in the right hand input, in this case, prereq. So there is a row in prereq which is CS347, CS101, which does not have any matching code. So you will observe that it appears here with null for all the fields from uh, codes, which are not there in prereq. Course ID is now not null because it is in prereq. And that non-null value is taken. For course dot course ID, it would be null, that is merged into the non-null value. And finally, there is a full outer join, which preserves rows in both relations. So the first two tuples, as before, are from the inner join. So note that the regular join is called the inner join to contrast it with outer join. So the first two rows here are common in all the relations. They are the inner join. And then the outer join adds extra rows. In this case, all rows from both sides are preserved. So we get those two extra tuples. Any questions? So the SQL syntax for this, they couldn't quite put it in the where clause. In fact, Oracle tried to do this. Oracle, uh, those of you who have used Oracle are, may know about the syntax where you say plus equal to. It's actually a very clumsy notation. And Oracle eventually has given up on it. And they, have, they still support it for backward compatibility, but they discourage you from using it. So don't use it. This is the right uh, syntax, which is supported by all the major databases. So now the general syntax for outer join has to say which rows have to be preserved. So it turns out that in the uh, standard SQL from clause, you just give a list of relations. There is no ordering. It does, what order you list them in really doesn't matter, except for the order in which attributes appear in the result. Other than that, it has no impact. For outer join, the way you do the outer join, so supposing, um, let me write it here. Supposing you did R, and let me show the uh, symbolic notation for outer join here, R left out, uh, sorry, R left outer join S, left outer join T. Okay, so this is a natural left outer join in the relational algebra syntax. Supposing this is your query. Now, in what order do we do the outer join? You could interpret this in two ways. One is like this, and the other is. Now, if you did this with natural join, it doesn't matter which one you use. Whether you use this one or this one, the result is exactly the same for natural join. It doesn't matter. However, for outer joins, it does matter. If you did this, you will get a one result. If you did this, you would get another result. So what is the difference here? Supposing there is a T tuple, which does not have any matching S tuple. But it does match an R tuple. So in this case, the T tuple could match the R tuple and get output. In this case, what would happen if it does not match any S tuple, it would be eliminated and it would not appear in the final result because it's a left outer join, not a right outer join. So these two are different. And therefore, the syntax of the query itself has to make it clear whether you're using this or this. SQL actually has a default. If you say nothing, it assumes that. But at the least, you should be able to write it out in order. So if you write this using the old Oracle syntax, it's not clear which you mean. There's no way to clearly specify whether you meant this or that. So the syntax now explicitly asks you to list the join almost as if it were relation algebra in the from clause. This is where the natural join also came in. Remember, we wrote the natural join in the from clause with parentheses. 
all the join expressions in SQL follow the same basic principle that you have to list it as an parenthesis expression. The parenthesis can be left out, but it's implicit. You have to do that in the from clause. And we will see examples, but the syntax is fairly general. It has two parts. The first part is a join type, and the second part is a join condition. And you can mix and match between these two. So what are the join types? Inner join, which is a regular thing. Uh, there is the left outer join, right outer join, full outer join. The join condition, you could have natural join. What does that do? It matches all columns with the same name, but it has one extra effect, which is it removes duplicate columns. In, uh, on predicate, applies a condition and only allows through matching rows, which satisfy the condition. Using A1 through AN, a list of attributes, is exactly the same as natural join, except it's only on the attributes which you specify. The other attributes are not equated, they stay as is. So that's the, uh, these are the two types, the join type and the join condition. You can mix and match and get any expression you want. So here is an example. Course inner join prereq on course dot course id equal to prereq dot course id. This is the standard inner join. You could have written it as from course comma prereq where course dot id equal to prereq dot course id. In contrast, you write course left outer join prereq on course dot course id equal to prereq dot course id. Now, supposing you instead did the following. Course um, inner join uh, prereq, and we need some on condition, say on true, which means all uh, rows match, where course dot course ID. Equals prereq dot course id. This is the normal SQL. This is what happens in effect because it takes a cross product logically. The optimizer will uh, try to evaluate it in a more efficient way, but this is normally what happens. Now, supposing instead of saying inner join, I said left outer join, what will happen? So the first step is every course and prereq pair is generated, whether it matches or not. And then the filter is applied. But what happens? Does this give you the left outer join? No. Why does it not give you the left outer join? Yeah. You are applying the condition of uh, course dot course id equal to prereq dot course id after the left outer join. In this case, the left outer join didn't really have an impact because anyway, everything matches. But if you had a condition here, instead of on true, I put some other condition here. You would get the left outer join. But then this condition may eliminate all those rows which had null on the right hand side. In this case, there won't be any. But if there were a condition here, uh, if prereq dot course ID is null, this condition would eliminate all such rows. So the point is, if you want a left outer join, the condition has to be part of the outer join specification, the on clause. You cannot do it in the where clause. That's the important point to note. Is this clear? So whenever you specify left outer join, right outer join, full outer join, the condition should be specified right there, not in the where clause. Don't put it back in the where clause. So moving on, um, the right way to do it here is course left outer join prereq on that condition. And then there are the variants uh, which we discussed. We have the course natural right outer join, course natural left outer join, and course right outer join prereq using course ID, which in this case is the same as natural join because that's the only common attribute. But in general, it may not be the same. Uh, this should have been full outer join, it's not right outer join. Okay. Okay. So here is uh, here are a couple of questions. You don't have to actually answer it with a clicker, but just for you to think about. Um, are S left outer join and S right outer join the same? No, of course not. A very simple quiz. Uh, then the next one, which of the following give exactly the same? Are 
natural join S, R join S using B, R join S on R dot B equal to S dot B. Again, a very simple question. Exactly the same result, meaning the same set of columns. Remember, natural join and join using both retain only one copy of a column. If the same column is there in both, it retains only one copy. Whereas on retains both columns. Whether they match or not, both columns are retained. So uh, it's not B and C, A and B. A and B are the same. C gives an extra column, which uh, in the case of, uh, you know, in this case it's a regular inner join. So both will have exactly the same value, but they will be that wise. R dot, uh, what is the common? R dot B and S dot B will both be there. In the case of uh, left outer join, supposing we had the same thing, but C part is R left outer join S on R dot B equal to S dot B, then you may have rows where R dot B is not null, S dot B is null. You would get such rows. Okay, so that uh, leaves us just a couple of small topics which we will wrap up SQL with. Uh, the first is view definitions. You're all familiar with view definitions. We saw the width clause yesterday. Views are more or less the same, except that they are persistent. They are stored in the database. Once you declare a view, it's like a regular relation in the database. <coughs> Almost like a regular relation. Why? Because its contents are not necessarily stored. It's just a definition which is stored. If you use it, the view can be computed on demand. In fact, it need not be computed fully on demand. In fact, that's not how it works. The way it, the uh, databases handle views is they take the view definition and expand it into the query. And we'll see how that works in a moment. So let's um, take a view, create view faculty as select ID name, department name from instructor. What is this doing? It's just removing the salary attribute. This is one example of the motivation for views, which is to hide things from certain users. Uh, it turns out that um, you know, the SQL has a means of allowing people to see certain tables and not others. Uh, so this is called access control. Now, access control in SQL is at the level of an entire table or on certain columns of a table. Uh, it, and it is very useful in certain ways. Uh, for example, if you build an application, you have different people managing the application. So you can protect this, so only certain people have full rights to it, other people have only read rights and so on. However, the SQL um, access control mechanism, uh, which was originally meant for end users who are using a database system, these days is not all that useful because on most databases, the front end is a web or some other tool, which does not actually take end user logins. It uses some internal login. So the access control mechanisms of SQL are not useful for web applications, typically, because web users do not correspond to database users. So there's a whole means in SQL, which many of you might know, for granting privileges. And views can be part of that. So if you want to uh, allow people access to certain things, you can create a view and grant them rights to the view, but not to the underlying relation. In this case, the view simply hid a certain column, but you can have it differently. You can create a view which hides certain rows. Okay, so maybe uh, you want to reveal the salary of certain people, but not others. So you can have a query which only outputs the salary of those people, and then that can be exposed, while the salary of others is hidden. So that view can be made available to a user, but not the original relation. So views are still very useful for access control but not for web apps. Okay, now coming back, uh, here is another example of a view. Um, oh, sorry, before that, here's a use of a view, select name from faculty where department name is biology. So what happens here? Conceptually, this faculty relation here is replaced by the view definition. And in fact, it's very easy in SQL today. You can have a subquery in the from clause. So you can just replace faculty by that whole query there and you're done. That's a valid SQL query, and then that's what is executed. There's other kinds of views which are uh, also very useful, which is to get aggregates, not the raw data. 
In fact, this is very common where you do not want to expose raw data, but you do want to expose aggregates to users. And so this is an example where you don't show the individual salaries of instructors, but you are willing to show the total uh, salary uh, budget of a particular department. So select department name, some salary from instructor group by department name. Okay, now what happens to a department without instructor? Yeah, that department is missing from the instructor table. Therefore, it will not appear in this result. So supposing you did want it to appear, departments with zero instructors, you want it to appear with a zero budget, what would you do? By the way, we have had such departments IIT. When a new department is formed, sometimes it's created with nobody in the department, actually. There's somebody from some other department who is initially in charge of recruitment or whatever. So there can be periods when this happens. Yeah. So we can use left order. We saw another way yesterday, which was to uh, write a subquery in the select clause. The other way is to use a left auto join. So how would you write this query? So we want department left auto join instructor. So just for variety, let me write it using relational algebra. So department left auto join instructor. So this is going to give me every department with null for all the instructor fields if there is no instructor. Now what do I want? I'm going to use the gamma or the calligraphy key operator. And I want to group by department name. And what is the aggregate that I want here? Sum of salary. I can write this in SQL also. The syntax would be what? Select department name, comma, some salary from department left auto join instructor. You can say natural left auto join instructor. Group by department name. Now what will happen? If a department had no instructor, the set would be empty. It would have a, only a single element. Sorry, not empty set. The set has a single element which is null. And that null is eliminated, you get an empty set. Okay. So what is the sum of an empty set? Zero, null. OK, here's the lab assignment. Try this out today. Okay. We saw yesterday what to do. If we want to replace null by zero, we saw what to do yesterday. Okay. Hmm? No, NVL is uh, Oracle. In standard SQL, there is a way, uh, which is supported now by everybody. You can use coalesce. Coalesce uh, something, let's say some salary, comma, zero, would uh, take some salary if it is non-null. If it is null, it goes to the next one, which is zero. So that's what you should, don't use NVL. I think Oracle also supports coalesce. OK, so try this out in the lab. So there are other examples of views, view expansion. I'm going to skip all those. Uh, I'll just show this slide, which points out that you can define one view using another, and then use that to define a third view, and you can have a cascade of views like this. So the view expansion basically replaces, it takes the given query. If there's any view in it, it replaces by its definition. That, in turn, may have another view in it. Again, it replaces all those views by their definitions and keeps doing it until there are no more views left. Okay, so that's the basic algorithm. Uh, find any view relation, replace it by the expression until no more view relations are present in E1 here. Now, as long as the view definitions are not recursive, this will terminate. Now, what do I mean by recursive? Supposing I define a view in terms of itself. Is this even a good idea? Why should we allow it? It sounds like a bad idea. This algorithm will never terminate. Right? So should you even consider it? Should you just ban it and be happy? Does it make any sense to have recursive views? Votes. Let's decide this democratically. <laughs> How many votes for having recursive views? Nobody. One. How many votes for totally banning recursive views? Why? Nobody is voting. Zero, OK, one. <laughs> Poor water turnout, election canceled. <laughs> OK, 
So of course, this is not democratic. So there are, in fact, uses for recursive views, which were not supported by the SQL standard earlier. Uh, so there were a whole bunch of researchers who were working on recursive query processing before it came into SQL. And in fact, my own PhD was in this area, recursive query processing, how to efficiently uh, do, uh, you know, evaluate queries where there are views which are defined recursively in terms of themselves. Uh, I, there is a section in the book which in, in chapter five which we don't have time to get into, but it gives several motivating examples for recursive views. So one such example is if I have a chain of managers. In most organizations, there is an organization hierarchy. Each person has a manager, the person they report to. Eventually, there is a boss, the CEO. And who does the CEO or the director report to? Sometimes there is a board. Or for uh, private institutions, there is an owner. The owner doesn't report to anybody. Okay, so you have a natural hierarchy. Similarly, there are parts. So you may say that a car consists of these parts. An engine, a door, and so on. Engine itself consists of these parts. Now one of those parts, engine itself consists of subparts. So you have a hierarchy. So hierarchy is a one example where, supposing I want to say, find me the bill of materials for this part. What is the bill of materials? These are individual parts, indivisible parts, from which this thing is constructed. I have this information in terms of hierarchy. This part consists of these parts, so many numbers of these parts. So a car has you know, four doors, four wheels, one engine, and so forth. And then one engine has maybe uh, you know, uh, so many subparts, cylinders, pistons, uh, head assemblies, whatever, you name it. So you can have all of this represented in a database. How do you represent it? You could, for example, represent it like this. Subpart, part, subpart, number. Okay, so this part, in, uh, say car, has, so you can say car, wheel, four, and so on. Car, um, engine, one car, uh, sorry, engine, uh, something, maybe four, and so forth. So I can represent it as a relation like this. Now supposing I want to say, find me all the bottom level parts of car. How many are there? Okay, so there is a way to write this, which SQL standard supports this. And several SQL databases support it. Uh, some of them have slightly varying syntaxes for this. Uh, Oracle has its own syntax. Uh, PostgreSQL has its own slightly variant syntax, and so forth. But most database systems today support at least some form of recursion. And such queries can be written in SQL by defining a view which says, uh, which is defined in terms of itself. So how would you define such a view? You can say that a view, for example, contains um, so this is just the base part, that is the individual ones, which you can't break up even further. This is the view which I want to define. So how would I do this? There are a few more relations. I won't get into the exact syntax for this, but let me give you the intuition. Supposing I know that this, I know what are the base parts. So if I know that, um, actually this number part is harder. Okay, so let me cut this out for the moment. It's a little trickier to define it. So let me skip that for the moment. So supposing I want to say that a part contains a base part. So if I have a subpart, I know that something is a subpart of another directly, and that part is a base part. It does not have sub further subparts. So I have a relation, base part, which says that these are the ones which do not have subparts. Or I can infer it by saying here is a part which is not in the subpart relation. So either way, 
I know that this does not have any further subparts, so this is the kind of thing that I want in this output. So I can say that it is contained in this if it is directly a subpart. Otherwise, I can have two levels. I can have essentially a join between subpart part part 1 and contains this is again just intuition okay this is not any particular syntax if i have a structure like this where i have a subpart of a particular part and it's subpart part 1 and i know that part 1 contains a base part i have already inferred this somehow then what can I infer? From this I can infer contains part base part. Okay. From this I can infer contains part base part. Okay. So there is syntax in SQL to write such things. And then there's a means of evaluating it also reasonably efficiently. So I'll just stop here as far as recursive views are concerned. Um, but you can go back and read it up from chapter 5 of the book. So you can't obviously do it by view expansion. There is a different mechanism for handling this. And there's even a mechanism to handle the count of numbers and so on, which is a little trickier to define. So I won't get into that. Finally, to wrap up views, uh, you, can you update a view? What does it mean to update a view? So the first thing which you could say is, don't ever allow view updates. Views are defined in terms of other relations. If you intended to update something, go intend the underlying relation. Don't update the view. So that's a first cut solution. But then in practice, people found that there are many situations where uh, somebody is given access to certain rows of a relation with some condition, but they should be allowed to update those rows. So then, practically speaking, people found that it is useful to allow people to update views under some limited conditions. Turns out, in general, can, uh, taking so you cannot actually update a view. All you can do is take an update defined on the view and translate it into an update on the underlying relation, such that the view will reflect the same thing. So if I had a uh, selection, I can only uh, look at and modify uh, faculty in computer science. There's an instructor relation, but I am allowed to view or update things in computer science. So I cannot directly go write an update on the instructor. I can write update on the my view of instructor, which is only computer science. And that will be translated by the database into an update on the instructor relation. So it turns out you can't always do this. But there are some limited cases where you can, in fact, do this. And uh, the slides over here, which I won't get into detail, uh, talk about this. Uh, for example, if you have a join, it becomes very difficult in general. If I update the result of a join, how do I know what update should do to the underlying relation? It's not well defined. There are many ways of doing it. Which do you choose? So the answer is, don't allow it. But if it's a simple select query, I'm just seeing a subset of the rows, it's usually a lot easier. So those are the cases which database systems support. Initially, the SQL standard didn't say much about it. Today, the SQL standard does say that in certain simple cases, you should allow updates through views. So I'm going to skip the details here. Uh, there are slides here on which show examples of when it can be done uniquely and when it cannot. Um, so for example, where it cannot, I have a view history instructor. I select star from instructor where department name equal to history. If we try to insert into this somebody in the biology relation, what will happen? It can never appear in the view result because this is a biology, not a history. So you cannot do this. You should not allow this update. Okay, so many SQL implementations will check, even for a view like this, uh, they will check if uh, the condition is satisfied, the department name equals history. If it's satisfied, they will allow an insert. If it is not satisfied, they will reject it. So, yeah, can be uh, done for um, 
Okay, made only for the history department. That's the answer to that quiz question. So uh, we are talking about the privileges, granting privileges to that particular individual users. Yeah. So is there any possibilities to grant such kind of privileges based on the domains, based on the fields, mm. for each and every user? By fields, you mean the value of a field? No, oh, domain sorry. I'm talking about. We are talking about views, isn't it? Create yes. view on the selected domains. Yeah. So for when we are using granting and all, we are uh, permitting insert, update such kind of privileges to each and every user. Yeah. Is it possible to grant such kind of privileges along with that particular field, particular uh, on particular domains, on, on a particular domain, rows? You mean the type itself? For example, uh, uh, register number like that. For example, faculty okay. ID a like sequence that. Sequence number. Yes. Yeah. So uh, yes, most uh, SQL implementations have. Uh, privileges for every object which is in the database. Uh, even for the privilege of creating a foreign key, uh, the privilege to use a sequence number. What is the sequence number? Uh, so there are many applications which need a sequential count which ensures that no two tuples have the same value. And a sequence number is a facility provided by many databases which lets you say, uh, use this value and aut it automatically gets incremented when it's used. Mm -hmm. So when you insert a new tuple, you can say that this column should take a value from this sequence number. And where each time you add a new tuple, a new value is derived from that sequence number. Mm -hmm. So there are privileges on that. There are privileges on views. So I don't have time to get into the full set of privileges. But the SQL privilege system is uh, fairly extensive. It's very good, except, except for the fact that it does not have any idea of who is a web application user. It only has a notion of who are database users. So it's useful in that context, but not in other contexts. Uh, sir, typically, updation of a view would be in regard with uh, addition of rows and col or columns. Uh, uh, so no, no, not that way. So I think you misunderstood what I meant by update of a view. Okay. By update of a view, I meant insert a tuple into a view relation, or okay. delete a tuple, or update a tuple. Okay. You're talking of altering a view right. okay. to change the view definition. Okay. So altering a view is effectively the same as dropping the view and then recreating it. You can treat it like that. Uh, so uh, because there are no tuples stored with it normally. So you can just delete it and recreate it. Well, of course, there are some issues. If some other view uses this view, you can't just drop it. So the alter view, in fact, can take care of it. So you can have a alter uh, view uh, syntax. I think, I think the SQL standard does support it. Uh, dropping it and creating it may affect other views. So ideally, you should have an alter view which simply changes the view definition uh, without affecting other views which depend on this. Hmm? Uh, I think it is. You should check this out. I have not actually tried this on PostgreSQL or Oracle, but you can try it out. A difference between with class and view. Uh, difference between the with class and views. Okay. So uh, as I said uh, yesterday, the with clause is like a temporary view defined in the context of that one query. It does not go into the database schema. A view is stored in the database schema like other relations. That's the main difference. Does a view take a uh, memory byte separately for the uh, a view data? Memory part meaning? Where memory is the byte, memory byte. Hmm? Memory, memory. Memory. Yeah, exactly. So where is the data for this view stored? Is that the question? Uh, is there any mapping? So From the original table, or view is separately uh, existed in a. So the default new form. is that the view data does not exist at all. All exactly. that is stored in the database is the view definition. The text. So that means view that. is a mapping. That text is what is stored, and when you use the view, it is expanded in line. That is the default. Okay. However, it's good you ask this question because many databases today support what is called a materialized view. Let me just write the term here. So what is a materialized view? It's a view for which the data has been computed and is stored. So if I use the view, I'm not actually computing the data. It's already there. I'm just looking it up. So most databases today, I think PostgreSQL doesn't yet support it. Maybe it will in future. But the commercial databases do support it, Oracle, SQL Server, DB2, and so on. This is in contrast to what I just told you. I just told you that a view definition is stored, no data is stored. Now I'm saying in a materialized view, data is stored. 
So there are some issues here. Supposing I'm storing the data, and now I update the underlying relation. So I have a view defined in terms of, so let me give you an example of the most useful uh, kind of view there on aggregation. Yeah, so look at the query at the bottom. A view of department salary totals. Now supposing I have a lot of instructors, which is unrealistic, but let's say that instead of instructors, I have a view like this, which is total sales of each item in a big retail shop. We have a lot of big shops, you know, Big Bazaar and Chroma, E-Zone, whatever. We have a lot of these. Now they have a lot of sales. Right? Each shop must be selling thousands or tens of thousands of items a day. If you aggregate across all the shops of a particular retailer, they may have maybe millions of items sold each day. And then if you aggregate across a year, you have you know, hundreds of millions of items sold in a year. Now supposing I want to know across all these thing, shops, how many uh, copies of a particular thing were sold? Let's say how many copies of the database system concept book did Flipkart sell? Now I can go through all the sales data and select out rows, add it up. It's going to take a lot of time if I run on a few hundred million records in there. But this is a kind of query which is very natural. In fact, um, many sites will show you some information. Um, like if you go to Amazon, it will say this book is ranked number so and so in sales. They don't tell you the actual raw number, but they give a rank which is for which you have to anyway compute the raw number. So the idea is that you pre-compute these things. So this result you pre-compute and store. So now if I want to know the sales of a particular item, I just look it up. You also build an index on this result. So I just look it up. So what do you mean by build an index? If you are not familiar, I'll come to it. But it lets you very quickly get to a particular row of that table and return that answer very quickly. So such views which do aggregates are very good candidates for materialization. So the issue is that if the moment one more item is sold, the view is now out of date. Because one more copy of the book was sold, the view recorded it as 100 copies, now the 101st copy has been sold. What to do about it? Okay, there are many possible answers. For the sales, do I really care about the up-to-date sales as of this minute? Probably not. If, if you tell me the sales up to last week were this much, I'm happy with that. If you tell me the sales up to last night were this much in other situation, I may be happy with that. So what does this mean? I can recompute the result once in a week or once in a day or whatever and store it. But there are some applications where I need up-to-date results. As of now, I want the result. In which case, the moment I update an underlying relation, I add one more sales item, I need to update the count of total sales of that item as part of the same transaction. This update is done automatically, that is done. How do you do that? In earlier days, a standard way of doing that was by using triggers. You could define a trigger on sales. Every time a sales occurred, it will find a corresponding row in the total and add it to the total. So you could do that. But it turned out that this is actually a pain to keep track of, do it properly. What if there was a sale done by mistake, it was deleted? Now you have to undo that. So your deletions have to be taken care of. What if a sale was updated? Instead of five, it was updated to three. You have to update it. So for each such thing, insert, delete, updates, and so on, you have to write this trigger code carefully to update the total sales. I, expecting users to do this correctly is a pain. If they make a mistake, the result is wrong. So you're giving wrong information to the users. So most databases found that initially started off by using triggers for keeping these aggregate results up to date. But later they provided separate syntax, which is actually much easier for the user. So you could simply say, instead of create view, you could say create materialized view. And then the database automatically stores that result. And there are other syntaxes which other databases use, but with equivalent result, that the view is computed and stored and can be used. And you can even create an index on the view, which uh, lets you efficiently access tuples based on certain conditions. So you don't, no longer need triggers for that, for those databases. In fact, it's a lot more efficient if it's done by the database. Triggers are slow. If the database directly takes care of this, it's much, much faster. So the question is, how many views can you create on a table? 
that depends on the implementation. Uh, there's no standard answer to it. So go look it up for whichever one you're using. Uh, but uh, I think it's a fairly large, I don't think it's a very tight restriction. I've not heard of anybody creating so many views that they run into trouble. But yes, there may be limits. Yeah, so uh, there's this area called online analytical processing, which focuses on giving users very, very fast access to aggregate views, aggregates in different ways. So the aggregate we saw was uh, salary, um, sum of salary grouped by department. There may be other things that we want. I want the salary per year. What was the salary this year? What was the salary last year, the year before? I want to see how the salary trend is going. So it's a different group by year, rather a year and department or just year across the whole institute, across all departments. So there are many combinations of group by which one might ask for. So an OLAP system is designed to very quickly give you answers to such aggregate queries. So OLAP, let me write it down here. Again, there is material in the book on OLAP, so you can go read it up. OLAP is short for online online analytical processing. So analytical is basically data analysis for analyzing data. And the core operation and analysis is statistics. You know, sum, count, median, whatever, the usual aggregates. So it's focused on very quickly answering aggregate queries over very large amounts of data. Now, how do they do this? How do they answer queries very fast? Essentially by using materialized views. That's the core underlying technology. Uh, so one way is to materialize every possible um, aggregate view on a particular set of, uh, on, a, on a given relation or a given set of relations. Every possible query that an analyst may ask, grouped by every possible combination, you pre-compute everything and materialize it. Okay? So th this is what initially people did, but then they realized that this can get, become very, very large. You don't want to store so much data. So then they said, well, can we materialize certain things and then compute others from it. So for example, supposing I have computed group by department comma year. From this, supposing I want to get the same sum but group by department. What do I have to do? I have to take the salary for, for each year, if I have this group by result, I take, this, I, I, I take this and add it up across all the years. And then I will get the total salary of the, uh, well, this is not salary, salary is just a fixed number. Let's say sales. Sales by uh, something else instead of department, item comma year. So I have this, now I can, so let me just change this. So I want the sales group by item. I can simply take the previous one and add it up. Now, how many tuples do I have to add up? Typically, you know, uh, these shops have been around only for five years. Even the oldest uh, uh, companies have been around only for a few hundred years. And of course, they don't have such old data. So if you add up maybe 20, 30 item years, I can get this, which is quite fast. So they reduce the amount of things which they pre-compute and store, but they can still give you results very quickly. That's the idea of OLAP system. So that's a big uh, business in itself. Many companies need this kind of analysis. Why do they need it? They need it for forecasting what items to stock, uh, how much to keep in stock, what items to manufacture. There's a huge, huge commercial uh, you know, interest in doing this because it affects profits of companies severely. If you produce too many uh, cars, uh, this happened to Maruti, right? You, you know, they produced a lot of cars, I think Altos or something, they were not selling, but the, their Desire and Swift were backlogged. There was not enough capacity. And it's hard to go build a new plant for it. If they could have predicted this, they could have, ahead of time, they could have switched a factory from producing, let's say, Alto to producing Swift and Desire. Uh, they didn't quite anticipate this. It's hard to predict in general. I mean, how do you know the future? Like they say, it's uh, very hard to predict the future. Um, so 
mistakes will happen, but the goal is to minimize the chances of making such mistakes by using an analysis. If you can see the trend, you, can, you could have maybe seen a trend that over the year, consumer preferences are slowly shifting from smaller cars to larger cars. If they had anticipated this trend, they could have caught it. But of course, sometimes the trends are changed by what the company does. Uh, maybe the company created the trend by creating a nice product, but they didn't anticipate it's such a roaring success. But still, it, analysis is very, very important for this. So there's a huge market for OLAP's online analytical processing systems. They're essentially databases with extra stuff in there for um, deciding what to pre-compute. Uh, and some of that is stored in memory, some of it is stored on disk and so forth. Now last uh, few topics on SQL. Uh, there's this notion of transactions. We'll come back to transactions a little bit later, uh, very briefly in the implementation issue. But if you, first we need to understand what is a transaction. You've all done transactions at a shop. You go buy some item, you pay some money, and you exchange it. You give the shopkeeper money, the shopkeeper gives you the item. That's a transaction. Now there are typically at least two parts of a transaction. One is taking the goods, the other is paying the money. If you paid the money and didn't get the goods, you'd be very unhappy. If you got the goods and didn't pay the money, you'd be happy, but the shopkeeper would be very unhappy. So both should happen or neither should happen. You can walk out of the shop without buying anything. Or you can pay the money and get it. Either of those is acceptable. But one happening, the other not is not acceptable. So in the context of a database, a similar thing happens. If I want to transfer money from one account to another, I want to create a, a, a deposit cash, I'm handing over cash, it should be recorded, or the person should give it back. Um, so there are transactions which involve the external world and the database. I go to an ATM machine, I withdraw cash, now, either I get the cash and my account is debited, or neither. If my account is debited but I don't get the cash, I'll be unhappy and vice versa. Now, implementing transactions in general is a, a complex task. It's done routinely, but it's non-trivial. So for ATM, what all can go wrong? The machine might jam, right? It, it has counted the bills, it's pushed it out, now it's jammed. You're pulling at the notes, it doesn't come out. It's rare, but could happen conceivably. What then? Or the machine could go bonkers, power goes off, some glitch, it has counted the cash, it has not dispensed it. What happens then? Now maybe your account is debited still by mistake. So what, what is done? In the real world, transaction handling, making sure that transactions are atomic, in the sense both parts happen or neither happens, it's actually quite hard when you have the external world. It gets fairly complex. So in ATM, it goes to the point where the ATMs have a little camera. And if a customer says, look, I tried to withdraw cash, I didn't actually receive the cash. And he complains to the bank, you have debited my account. And the bank will look at that camera and say, what actually happened? And if they see the cash coming out, they'll say, you're lying. We'll report you to the police. Or if the cash didn't come out, they'll say, okay, we will credit it. So it's fairly complex, it involves recovery. You should have a record of what happened. That camera image, the video, is a record of what actually happened over there. And based on that, you either refund the amount from the debiting in the account, or you say, no, it's okay. Now, all of these have counterparts which are entirely in the database. So external actions are more complicated. That requires a case-by-case uh, -case handling, but there is a direct counterpart inside the database, where you want these two updates to happen in the database or neither happen. For this, there is a standardized way of handling it internally. So that is part of what it means to be an atomic transaction. There's also an issue of concurrency and so on, which we'll come to later, but the focus here is atomic transaction. So, in the SQL standard, it says that you can run a sequence of statements, but only when you say commit work will all those updates be reflected in the database. Till then, you can always say abort or rollback work, which means everything that was done up to that point is rolled back. So one of these two should happen. If neither happens, the database crashes for whatever reason, or 
you go away and the session is terminated, then the default should be rollback. That's the standard. In real life, though, this was inconvenient. And uh, so most implementations don't do it that way. What they do is, by default, as soon as you run an SQL command, it's done. So if I want to update two things, I'm transferring money I want from one account to another. I update this, I update that. I update this, if the crash happens, the other won't get updated. That's a problem. It's the database is inconsistent. And the way to do it correctly is uh, to tell the database, don't automatically commit. So by default, most databases will automatically commit. As soon as you run an SQL statement, it's committed, done. But you can tell the system, don't do that. How do you tell it? It depends. Uh, there are, uh, there's a SQL 99 standard which says begin atomic end. So everything in between will either be completely committed or rolled back. It can't be intermediate state. But many databases don't support this. Uh, there's another alternative. If you're using an API, JDBC and so on, there's a way to say, turn off auto commit. So by default, most databases have auto commit turned on. But if you want two updates to happen atomically, you turn off auto commit, do the two updates, and then say commit, or roll back, one of the two. So how is this implemented? Um, we'll briefly look at it later. But the point here is I just want you to be aware of this idea of what is the transaction. OK, now to wrap up SQL, uh, we'll come back to integrity constraints. Somebody had asked me about cascading integrity constraints. That's so we already saw the not null primary key, foreign key. There are other constraints, like check predicate, which can be any predicate. I'm uh, going to skip these, because you've already seen most of these. Check is a simple thing. Just look at the bottom here. Check semester in fall, winter, spring, summer. That's one way of doing it. Okay, so this has a section with a semester. Now, this was partly done to illustrate this feature. A better way to have done it might have been actually to have a semester master table. And then the semester is a foreign key referencing that table. So that will force it to be one of the values in that table. So then if I want to add a new semester, I can easily add it. Uh, here, I can't add a semester without going and saying alter table, modify constraint, alter constraint. It's, the syntax is, and support is very non-standard. Foreign keys we already know, but the point I wanted to talk about here is cascading actions. So here is a variant of the earlier course declaration, which says department name is there. And it is a foreign key department name, references department, on delete cascade, on update cascade. What does this cascade mean? If I delete a department, automatically all courses in that department should be deleted. If I update a department name, automatically the department name of all the referring courses should be updated. That's the, what this says. Uh, there are alternatives. I can say on delete set null, on delete set default. If I want to retain that information without losing it, I can still do that. Um, for example, if I have uh, a certain transaction and I rep I'm recording which employee did it, I want to delete the employee totally, I might still keep the transaction and set null. It turns out, uh, actually, deleting data is a bad idea in many situations. Um, I may want to keep historical data. Um, so this should be used very rarely. The cascade should be used rarely. More often, you want to keep the historical data. And then there are variants which people work on. Say, a department is closed. No more students come in that department. Okay, however, there are old students who are in that department. I don't want to change that department. I don't want to set the department to null. None of this makes sense. So then, how is that handled? Usually by uh, uh, maybe creating a view called active departments. And there's a table called departments, per se, which is, includes historical departments. And when I want to see what departments are there currently, I will see the view active departments. How do I know which is active? I'll set a flag with the department saying active is y or true. So then the view will say departments where active is true. So then I will see only active departments. Otherwise, I will see all this clutter of old departments which are closed. We have quite a few like that. There is a certain churn, more than departments, programs. So I have a BTEC in something or an 
a dual degree in something that is close, but students did graduate with that. So that program should still be remembered and not deleted. But no new people should be added to that program. OK. Now, there are some details here about integrity constraint violation during a transaction. Now, why would this happen? Um, I think I'm going to skip this for lack of time. Uh, I'll urge you to go read these slides later on to see what is going on. Deferred checking and so forth. There's some stuff on other built-in data types. So this is useful. The SQL standard has a lot of time-related data types. So date is one. Time, which is time of day, is another. Timestamp, which is date plus time, is a third. And finally, there's something called interval, which is a gap of time. It's not like, you know, interval is not necessarily saying from May 6 to May 8. It says two days. That's an interval. So these are all types which are valid in uh, SQL. The support for these types varies. I think Oracle does not do date and time. It only has time or had. This keeps changing. But this is what the SQL standard specifies. And there are many more variants which I won't get into. And the last topic in this section is index creation. I mentioned this briefly. What is an index? It's a secondary structure which is used to efficiently retrieve data. So here, I have created a table student. I want to look up students based on their ID very efficiently. I don't usually look up on name. So if I have a lot of students, if I give an ID, I should be able to zoom in on that tuple very fast. If I give a name, I don't mind scanning the whole table, searching for people with that name, because that is rare. So how do I efficiently retrieve a particular tuple given an ID? So there are data structures called indices. Many of you are probably know about it. We will, if you are not familiar with it, we will get back to it later. Uh, but the SQL databases typically have a statement like this, create index, you can give it a name on relation with a set of attributes there. Okay. Indices are covered in great detail in chapter 11. Okay. So there are a few other things, large objects, authorization, privileges, which I'm going to skip. Any questions now? Okay. So the question is, are assertions supported in Postgres? The answer is, the last I checked, uh, nobody supports assertions. Or at least nobody supports any useful form of assertions. So this is one of those things. Uh, Sometimes the standard bodies wait for uh, demand for a feature to be big enough before they standardize it. And then what happens is, meanwhile, each database implements it in its own way. So this happened for a while. Then they said, wait, we don't want to do this. Let us anticipate what people might need and what databases may support and provide a standard for it ahead of time. Assertions were one such. They anticipated a need for it. Um, but most databases never ended up supporting it. So it's there in the standard, nobody supports it. So, yeah. Can you repeat the question? What will happen if we'll go for a materialized view that doesn't contain the prime attributes of the parent relations over which it is defined? And we are going to insert some data into it. Yeah, so materialized views often, for example, aggregate views, right. do not have a primary key of the underlying sales relation. That's not an issue. So what will happen if we'll go for inserting some data into that materialized view? Mm -hmm. So that will be reflected in the original relation. Uh, in what sense? If you if you insert some data, some uh, a tuple in the materialized yeah. view, yeah, will it be reflected in the uh, original relation? So supposing I have a materialized view, and I insert into the materialized view, no, no. So typically, uh, uh, updates on views first of all are restricted, and the same rules will apply for updates on materialized views. So it's very restricted where you're allowed to do that. The main use for materialized views is where it's read-only, not with updates. Updates on views were more for views intended for security. That was a motivation. Whereas materialized views, the primary motivation is querying. They're aggregates. You cannot meaningfully translate an update on a materialized view to an update on the underlying relation. So most of the time, it's not supported. So you cannot update them. Typically, materialized views uh, will not be updatable. OK. So there are a couple more topics on uh, related to SQL indirectly, which is how to 
access SQL from, not from a PSQL, not from PG admin and so on, but from a programming language. 